Hey everybody, it's nutritionist Amy Berger from toitnutrition.com bringing you another video in doing keto without the crazy. Today's topic is an important one and it's actually one I'm surprised I haven't covered yet. It is acid reflux or GERD, G-E-R-D, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And clearly this is a super, super common problem. If it wasn't super common, we wouldn't have, at least in the US, entire aisles of supermarkets and drugstores devoted to antacids, whether it's in pills or tablets or powders or liquids. Clearly, a lot of people out there have a heartburn or acid reflux. In fact, one of my very good friends um, has it so bad, she had a, a reflux attack, I guess I'll call it one, so bad, she thought she was having a heart attack. She almost called and like got herself an ambulance to go to the hospital because she thought she was dying. It was just reflux, but it was that painful and that debilitating. So if you know someone, perhaps even yourself, who's popping out acids like candy, this video is for you or for them. And I am going to do something that I said I wasn't going to do anymore, but I'm doing it for my own good and hopefully yours. I'm actually going to read the text of a blog post that I wrote about this. And I'm going to read it just like I read the, the PCOS um, blog post in my PCOS video and the one about men's health because I don't I just don't want to forget anything important this stuff is important so I'll try to do like I did you know pause and emphasize certain things and I'll skip over some things that aren't important but um, before I even do that before I get into like the details if you or someone you love suffers from GERD really bad or heartburn really bad, you definitely want to read this book as soon as possible. Why Stomach Acid is Good for You. It's a skinny book. You can see it's a really skinny kind of book. You can just read this in a very short time. And I know you probably can't see on the video there, but I kind of have a lot of pages, you know, dog-eared and folded down. This is a classic in the nutrition profession, at least from my perspective. I don't think any nutritionist's office or bookshelf is complete without a copy of this book. This book will blow your mind. Why will this book blow your mind? Why is stomach acid so important? Let's find out. And most important of all, is there a role for a low carb or ketogenic diet in resolving, in ameliorating acid reflux? Let me spoil the ending for you guys. There probably is, or I wouldn't be talking about it on my channel, right? Yeah, in fact, contrary to what you might believe coming from the conventional world, eating more fat, eating more red meat, eating this sort of greasy, rich, oily food doesn't make heartburn worse, it makes it better. When you don't couple those oily, greasy, fatty red meat foods with lots of carbohydrate. So let's talk about things, shall we? <laughs> okay. So I was talking to my friend the other day, Tyler Cartwright of Keto Gains. You guys know ketogains.com? Check them out if you don't know them. We were chatting and he was saying how weird it is to get used to talking to no one. Like right now, you're listening. We're sort of talking to each other, but it's not a conversation because I'm the only one talking and I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at my webcam. I have to pretend like I'm interacting with you. It is a little weird, but now that my vid my channel is, is over a year old, I'm starting to get a little more accustomed to it. So I'm trying to like ease up because I know you're watching. I'm not talking right now to my kitchen, which is right behind my camera. I'm talking to you. So let's get talking. If television commercials for prescription and over-the-counter antacids are any indication, acid reflux has reached epidemic proportions. Stomach acid has launched an all-out attack on people's digestion and quality of life, inching its way up into the esophagus and causing the pain and irritation commonly referred to as heartburn. Now, you know, heartburn doesn't have anything to do with your heart, right? Um, we, we call it heartburn because that's sort of the area where we feel it. This upper chest, upper abdomen area is where we feel it. It's actually really nowhere near the heart but anyway um stomach acid is a natural normal essential thing why does it cause so much trouble for so many people all right stomach acid 101 huh. owing to the high incidence of acid reflux and GERD stomach acid has gotten a bad reputation it's been portrayed as something to reduce as much as possible or better yet completely neutralize if only we could eliminate stomach acid altogether we would have a permanent cure for acid indigestion right wrong your stomach is supposed to be acidic 
very acidic, between meals, an empty stomach, has a pH of about one to three, usually around two. During a meal, when food is inside the stomach, the pH of your stomach rises to about four to five. Now, I'm going to skip over this a little bit, just so you know, the pH scale is logarithmic. Well, maybe I'll just read it. The pH scale measures acidity. Seven is neutral. Lower than seven is acidic. Higher than seven is alkaline or basic. It's a logarithmic scale, so a pH of 6 is 10 times more acidic than a pH of 7, and a pH of 5 is 100 times more acidic than a pH of 7. So you can see that even when the pH of your stomach rises in the presence of food, meaning it becomes less acidic, it becomes more alkaline, it's still really acidic with a pH of 5 or so. To give you a better sense for this, lemon juice has a pH of about 2, and vinegar's pH is about 2 to 3. The pH of your empty stomach is only slightly less than that of battery acid. Your stomach is supposed to be acidic. Let's get that clear. Your stomach is supposed to have acid in it. Not only is your stomach supposed to be acidic, it must be acidic. The chemical breakdown of carbohydrates begins in your mouth thanks to enzymes in your saliva. They call it salivary amylase because it's starting to break down the amylose in the starch that you eat. Um, but the breakdown of proteins and fats begins in your stomach, and the primary conductor of the digestion orchestra is your stomach acid. So think of proteins as strands of Christmas lights, multiple cords that are all tangled up, all like jumbled up, lots of strings all jumbled up together in a big knot. Job number one of your stomach acid is to untangle these strands. It's a process called denaturing. When proteins are denatured, the enzymes in your small intestine that break them down into the individual amino acids that make those proteins up, they have better access to them and are able to break them down properly. So just to clarify, the stomach acid takes all these proteins that are tied up. And this is not the scientific term. I'm just trying to illustrate. The stomach acid kind of opens the proteins up so that when they pass from the stomach into the small intestine, which is where most of that stuff is actually fully broken down, now those digestive enzymes in the intestine have much more surface area on which to work. It's, it makes their job a lot easier. Bile does the same thing to fats. If you watch my video I did on doing keto with or without a gallbladder, bile does the same thing to fats. It breaks the fats up into teeny tiny droplets so that the enzymes that break the fats down have more surface area to work on. Okay, so point is stomach acid is really important. And here we go. Your stomach needs to be highly acidic, not just in order to properly denature the proteins, but also because that acidity signals other enzymes to perform their functions. And these enzymes function optimally in an acidic environment, like gastric lipase. Gastric means stomach. Lipase is an enzyme that breaks down fats. Anything that ends in ACE, A-S-E, is an enzyme, like gastric lipase, salivary amylase, uh, I don't know, I can't think of any more, even though there's a million, carbonic anhydrase, when you breathe, like there's a million enzymes, they all end in ASE. And so gastric lipase, lip, lipo is fat, gastric lipase begins the digestion of fat in your stomach. Most of it's absorbed later on, but the process starts in the stomach and it starts because the acidity of the stomach, I wouldn't say it signals to these enzymes, these enzymes are designed to function best in a highly acidic environment. So, additionally, the stomach is supposed to be highly acidic so that the denaturing of proteins can happen relatively quickly and your food can be passed along for the rest of your digestive tract to go to work on it. Food isn't supposed to sit in your stomach forever. Stomach acid is supposed to take care of the proteins, enzymes do some initial work on the fats and carbohydrates, and then the food is supposed to move along. Not only that, but when the food does move along, that too should be acidic. I'm gonna, exp I'm gonna read one more paragraph and then break it down into more understandable stuff. The acidity of the partially digested food, which is now called chyme, when you have stuff in your stomach that's already mixed with stomach acid and some enzymes and passing through into the small intestine, it's called chyme, C-H-Y-M-E. All right, the acidity of that partially, of the, the acidity of that chyme, because remember, it's the food mixed all with the stomach acid, the, that, that acidity entering the small intestine signals the intestine to secrete bicarbonate ions, which neutralize the acid, creating an alkaline environment in the small intestine. This is crucial, actually, 
my foot's falling asleep, I have to move positions. Ah, oh, much better, much better. Now the blood can flow to my foot again. Okay, where was I? I shouldn't have said the small intestine yeah, the small intestine signals the pancreas to secrete bicarbs. The small intestine doesn't secrete the bicarb, it comes from the pancreas. This is crucial because unlike the stomach, the digestive enzymes of the small intestine function optimally in an alkaline environment. You can see now that your stomach acid needs to be highly acidic because it sets the stage for proper digestion, not only in the stomach, but also in the small intestine, which is where the majority of digestion occurs. So just to recap, stomach supposed to be really acidic because the things that happen in the stomach are designed to happen in an acidic environment. When the food passes from your stomach into the small intestine, that first part of the small intestine called the duodenum or duodenum, I've heard it pronounced both ways, um, this is where the ducts from the, from the liver and the pancreas and everything, all the bile comes in, all the pancreatic digestive enzymes come in. That stuff is designed to work best in a more alkaline environment. And what signals the bicarbonate to come make it more alkaline is the acidity itself. When that really acidic stuff comes, the body's like, whoa, must neutralize acid. So what happens if that chyme isn't as acidic as it's supposed to be? Maybe that other stuff doesn't get signaled quite as effectively or maybe not as much of it gets secreted and your whole digestive cascade is not going to happen as effectively and as powerfully as it should or as it's supposed to. So the stomach acid really sets the stage for all of this. All right, what causes GERD? What causes acid reflux? Contrary to popular belief, many individuals with acid reflux don't have too much stomach acid. They have too little. If you have too little stomach acid or the acid you do produce is not sufficiently acidic, the acid isn't strong enough, food will remain in the stomach longer than it should. Some of the carbohydrates you consume, especially grains and beans, but other starches too, may begin to ferment as they remain in your stomach for a longer period of time, and this creates gas. This gas from this fermenting, bubbling up carbohydrates may put pressure on the lower esophageal sphincter, which is a small bundle of muscles between your esophagus and your stomach. This sphincter is supposed to remain closed except after you swallow and food presses against it from above, causing it to open to allow the food to pass from your esophagus plop into your stomach. Most of the time, this is a unidirectional process. One way, food goes from the esophagus into the stomach. Of course, unfortunately, it's not always unidirectional. If you've ever vomited, you know stuff can come back from the stomach up into the esophagus and out, right, unfortunately. Um, the thing is, the lower esophageal sphincter, that little muscle between your esophagus and your stomach is an involuntary muscle, meaning you can't deliberately move it the way you can with your quads or your biceps. You can't just say, all right, I'm gonna contract my lower esophageal sphincter. It doesn't work that way. So it opens and closes on its own. The opening of that sphincter during vomiting is a natural, response to an emergency need to eliminate something toxic, right? If you have food poisoning or you've ingested something crazy, your body's like, whoa, alarm, alarm, emergency, open up that sphincter, we gotta get this stuff out of here. But some people just have a weakened sphincter. It's, it's more prone to opening even under totally normal benign circumstances. And so, okay. The problem with foods coming back up or refluxing into the esophagus is that unlike the internal lining of your stomach, your esophagus has no protective layer. You're, I'm, I'm going off script a little bit. Your stomach, the inside of your stomach lining has a protective coating of mucus. And not like mucus coming out of your nose, but it's mucus. It's like a slimy substance that coats and films and protects the actual stomach. So. You have to, your stomach has to have that or the, 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 stom the acid secreted by the cells in your stomach that secrete acid, the acid would actually eat away at the stomach muscle itself. That's protein. Your stomach is a muscle sac that contracts and stuff. If it wasn't coated with the mucus, the acid would eat away at the stomach itself. Um, so thank goodness it has the protection. The thing is, your esophagus does not have that mucosal protection. So when food, even if your stomach isn't that acidic, like not as acidic as it should be, it's still acidic compared to a lot of the rest of your tissues. So when this sort of partially digested food comes back up into the esophagus through that sphincter, 
that acidity from that food is going to burn. It's going to burn that esophagus. That is what heartburn is. That's, that's why you feel that pain and discomfort. But remember, it doesn't happen because the stomach is too acidic. It happens either because the stomach is not acidic enough or for whatever reason, you may have a weakened sphincter that's just more prone to opening even when it shouldn't. Um, so what causes reduced output of stomach acid or weakened stomach acid? Stress is a major culprit. One people rarely think of when they think about indigestion and acid reflux, right? The cliche of a stressed out executive grabbing a fast food lunch, eating it, standing up, and then popping out acids for the rest of the day while running from one meeting to the next kind of has a lot of truth to it. So you, you've heard of the sympathetic nervous system, right? That's responsible for the fight or flight. The, oh, like I'm really stressed out, gotta, gotta run from a predator, gotta, gotta stay and fight, gotta literally fight or flee for my life. That's the sympathetic nervous system. There's a different part of your autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system. Sympathetic is fight or flight. Parasympathetic is rest and digest. If you are constantly stressed out and, and you can literally sort of feel your whole body is tight, do you think that's the optimal time to be eating and digesting food. If you are under an emergency situation or your brain and your stomach and your organs and tissues and glands perceive that you're in an emergency, like you're not really being attacked by a lion on the savannah, you're not really running for your life, maybe you're sitting in a really aggravating traffic jam or you're being yelled at by your boss or something else is going on that the old reptilian wired brain and the old organs and glands think is an emergency, but it's really not. Still, your body, the, the priority at that time is keeping you alive and, and shunting energy and blood and resources to things to keep you alive. What you don't need to be doing right at that moment is digesting the sandwich and bowl of pasta that you just had for lunch or dinner or whatever. So all of that stuff is kind of... Ah, it's not stopped, but it's not going to happen as well as it's supposed to if you were more relaxed. So, um, yeah, the physical breakdown of food begins in your mouth with chewing, but the biochemical aspects of digestion begin in your brain. If you're constantly stressed out, then your body interprets this as you're being in a perpetual crisis, in which case digesting your food is not a top priority. So stomach acid secretion is reduced. Another cause of reduced stomach acid is prescription antacids. Do I, I, yeah, I do talk more about that later because we're gonna come back to it. Two of the most common types are proton pump inhibitors and H2 receptor agonists. These drugs are prescribed to treat acid reflux and also for stomach ulcers. Like so many pharmaceutical drugs, by suppressing the secretion of stomach acid, these drugs do help alleviate heartburn in the short term in the acute sense, but over the long term, they actually make things worse. Go figure. Insulin didn't cure my type 2 diabetes. It actually made me worse. How interesting. Oh, long, oh in, in the moment, in the moment, my antacid makes me feel better, but over time, it's making me much worse. What a shock. Many people with acid reflux don't need less acid. They need more. So these drugs only address the immediate symptoms. They do nothing to correct the underlying problem. Again, why either? Why don't I have enough acid? Like it's being, we're treating the wrong problem. Or if I do have too much acid or even just the, the perfect amount of acid, why is it coming up? Why is that food refluxing back up? So let's see. Oh, other contributors to reflux in some people include smoking, heavy alcohol consumption, anatomical issues, such as if you have like a hiatal hernia that can... Um, that can cause a uh, reflux. Obesity might be another factor in GERD, specifically abdominal obesity, where fat is mainly carried at the midsection. Why? Because if you have extra weight, a lot of extra weight around the abdominal area, it's just physics. You're going to have more pressure, more pressure against all these organs and esophagus and all that stuff. Now, convention... I'm running out of time. Why did I... Why did I say I was going to read this? We're almost at 20 minutes and it's hot and I'm trying to fan myself. Let me skip over what I can skip over and just get moving here. Um, conventional advice for GERD and reflux. I'm debating stopping this video right now. 
I really wish I hadn't started reading this because now I feel like I have to finish. Um, let's just keep going, shall we? Conventional recommendations for people with GERD or acid reflux, one, remain upright after eating. For individuals with a weakened lower esophageal sphincter, letting gravity do its job might help reduce the likelihood that your food is going to come back up, right? If you are seated upright, it's more likely that the food is just going to stay down versus if you were reclining or if you were laying down. Like if you have a big dinner and now you're going to go lay down on the couch and watch TV, much more likely, again, just physics, that that stuff is going to have an easier time coming up. Um, so it also means maybe if you, if you have really bad acid reflux or GERD, don't eat a large meal right before bed. You know, I'm not opposed to late night eating. I know that's kind of like the third rail of nutrition. Everyone tells you not to eat late at night. Um, I don't think it's that big a deal, but if you have acid reflux, don't eat a big meal and then go lay down. Eat smaller meals. Smaller meals means less food in the stomach and therefore potentially less, again, less pressure, less likelihood for reflux. This is a controversial one and we'll come back to this part when I get to the ketogenic diets. They always recommend that you avoid acidic, spicy, and fatty foods, right? Um, now, while these foods, these foods may not be the primary cause of reflux, acidic foods may be more irritating to the esophagus when that sphincter is weakened, right? It's not, these foods are not necessarily causing the problem, but if you have the problem, acidic foods coming into the esophagus are going to make it even worse if the food is acidic to begin with, right? So... Acidic foods may be more irritating to the esophagus when the sphincter is weakened. These foods include coffee, carbonated beverages, tomatoes and tomato sauces, lemon and other citrus fruits, hot peppers, garlic, onions, vinegar, and other acidic foods. And really delicious foods! Some people with GERD also find that chocolate or peppermint, like peppermint tea or peppermint candy, really does a number on their reflux. Again, over if you, if you carry a lot of excess weight, potential solution could be try to lose some weight. All right, let's look at alternative approaches for GERD and acid reflux. Operating under the premise, that's, that's the conventional advice, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that, right? Nothing is wrong with any of that convention, you know, lose weight, avoid spicy foods, eat smaller meals, you know, sit up right after eating. Just like the antacid medication, none of that does anything to address the, uh, why is the problem happening? What, what is the problem? Those are fixing the symptoms. They're not addressing the root cause. That's always what we want to do, right? In the PCOS, the root cause is chronically high insulin. Get your insulin down. The erectile dysfunction, the benign prostate enlargement, insulin's the problem. Bring down the insulin. Stop treating the symptoms and let's go after that root cause, shall we? Okay. So alternative approaches for GERD and acid reflux, operating under the premise that acid reflux or GERD often result from insufficient stomach acid rather than an excess, um, some physicians and nutritionists may approach things differently from, from that advice. One piece of advice is to take supplemental HCL. HCL is hydrochloric acid, basically stomach acid. It is available in supplement form. And um, some people swear by this. Some people, it seems to do nothing. There's a lot of debate over how to dose this stuff. I'm not even going to get into that. The point is, if you think you don't have enough stomach acid, if I think a lot of these people that don't like protein or, or feel indigestion with protein or feel like protein kind of sits in their stomach like a brick, those people probably have low stomach acid because if you had a lot of good, strong stomach acid, it would dispatch that protein pretty quickly. So I do think there's definitely some people that could benefit from the HCL. Again, you can take it in supplement form. Moving on, take some vinegar with your meals, with or before, you know, 10 minutes before, do a shot of apple cider vinegar or some other kind of vinegar or put it in water and do it that way. I've been like taking apple cider vinegar shooters for a long time now, so it doesn't bother me at all. I can just shoot it down and it's, I mean, I chase it with some water, but it doesn't sting so bad anymore when I just take, you know, I'm not like, not a shot shot, like a, you know, a swig and maybe another swig or two. Uh, it doesn't have to be apple cider vinegar. That's the whole like mother earth, nature mama. It has to be apple cider vinegar. It has to be raw. It has to be the kind with the mother. What you need is the acid. Any vinegar will do this. Distilled white vinegar will do it. Champagne vinegar will do it. White wine vinegar, red wine vinegar, any kind. Balsamic vinegar, balsamic's just higher in carbs, so why not just use some other kind? Providing acidity directly may help increase the stomach's acidity. Many people find a squeeze of lemon in their water helps aid digestion, perhaps this is why. 
Keep in mind that many cultures around the world consume pickled or fermented foods with their meals, especially when their meals are rich or fatty, such as the European tradition of sauerkraut or cornichon with sausages or pate. Uh, these acidic condiments may be, con we can consider these really acidic condiments to be digestive aids. Think about it, you know, um, lactic, lactic acid if you have like a lacto fermented food like a, a traditionally made kimchi or a traditionally made sauerkraut those don't have vinegar but they have lactic acid so any kind of acid any kind of acidic condiment be it a pickle or a sauerkraut or a kimchi or like fermented pickled beets pickled anything pretty much is is going to help so it shouldn't really surprise us that so many cultures in very different parts of the world have that as a sort of tradition of their cuisine, some type of acidic or pickled or fermented condiment to maybe, maybe it's to ease digestion. Don't consume large amounts of liquid with meals. For people who already potentially produce insufficient stomach acid, it may be wise not to dilute what is produced with excessive amounts of fluid. Hydrate enough throughout the day so that you're not overly thirsty at mealtimes, right? If you are drinking a lot of water to wash your food down, you're doing it wrong. I don't drink a whole lot with my meals at all. I don't sit there with a glass of water and refill it four times, you know? I may have a glass of wine or two at dinner now and then, but, um, you know, it's sipped very slowly. It's not guzzled and it's not a huge amount. Um, but I see people at restaurants getting sodas or water or whatever and refills, refills, refills. And that's probably fine for some people. Um, but if, if you specifically have this problem really bad, if you deal with really severe reflux and you happen to fill up on a lot of liquid at mealtimes, consider not doing that like I said, drink enough throughout the rest of the day that you are not going to die from thirst if you don't eat during your actual meal. Um, don't eat while acutely stressed. Relax. Allow that rest and digest sympathetic nervous system to do its thing. You know, try not to eat in your car. Don't eat standing up or when you're otherwise on the go. When possible, avoid conducting business during meals. Try to eat in a calm frame of mind and in pleasant surroundings. It's easier said than done, I know, especially if you're a, a parent, especially if you have young children, but try to eat in calm, unhurried circumstances. It's not always possible, I know. When I worked in an office years ago, I would do my best to step away and eat my lunch in peace, even if it meant like going just to another part of the building to, to be by myself and eat quietly. I hated, I hated eating at my desk while I'm responding to emails, while I'm answering the phone. That's the worst time to eat. You don't even really enjoy the food at that point. You're just shoveling it down while you're doing business. I don't, I don't know. That's, I just don't like the thought of that. So, um, and you know, I know, like I said, if you're a parent of young kids, you're just scurrying off all the time on the go in the car, playing chauffeur, got one half half of one eyeball on your plate and, and one and a half other eyeballs on your kid over there, right, to make sure that they're safe. But just try to, you know, remember that there's, there's fight or flight and there's rest and digest and just remember that, you know. And again, if you don't have reflux, if you don't have GERD, none of this applies. Keep doing what you're doing. If you deal with these issues, here are some things you could potentially try. Now, I said we would come back to antacids and I definitely want to because these drugs are not benign. I know people get those, those packs of like Rolaids or Tums, literally pop them like candy, like they're breath mints multiple times a day, you know, eat whatever you want, just take your Tums. And, and I'm not bad mouthing Tums, like, but it's just a brand. But these, these drugs are not benign. These drugs have very severe, potentially dangerous side effects slash consequences, especially from long-term prolonged use. Popping an acid once in a while is no big deal. It's not gonna really harm you. It's the very prolonged use. Some people get prescribed. They have such bad reflux that they get a prescription for an antacid medication and they take it for years, sometimes decades. Or if not a prescription, they'll get an over-the-counter but use it multiple times a day, every day for years. These drugs are not designed for long-term use and, and here's why. As mentioned earlier, prescription antacids inhibit the natural normal secretion of stomach acid. Actually, they, there's two different, there's different kinds of antacids that work through different mechanisms. Some of them actually, the proton pump inhibitors, 
inhibit the proton pumps, the pumps that pump out the hydrogen ions, which is the acid, the H plus of the HCl, um, the, for your chemistry nerds out there. Um, you take a drug that inhibits the, the mechanism of pumping the acid out, so you're not even pumping the acid. Other types of antacid drugs work by neutralizing the acid, so it doesn't interfere with the secretion of acid. The acid's there. What these drugs do is neutralize it, bring it back to like a, a neutral, not a neutral pH, but less of an acidic pH. So, as mentioned, all right, we, we inhibit or, or neutralize stomach acid, but stomach acid is essential for proper digestion, including liberation of vitamins and minerals from the foods you eat. Here's the clincher, guys. The old saying, you are what you eat, is not accurate. You're not what you eat, you are what you digest and absorb, right? So imagine the consequences for someone who's been dutifully taking a powerful antacid for years, maybe decades. Their absorption of key nutrients has been compromised for this length of time, which can affect any number of body systems and functions. So, and again, if you, if you read the post that I have linked to, look, this is the post, but if you actually look at it, you'll be able to click on all of the references. I mean, each, each of the things I'm about to say is backed up with, you know, scientific papers that you can read if you want to confirm. Owing to reduced absorption of calcium, zinc, iron, magnesium, and vitamin B12, long-term antacid use is associated with increased risk for several alarming outcomes. Chronic kidney disease, iron deficiency, hypomagnesemia, like low magnesium levels, uh, bone fractures, B12 deficiency, pneumonia, and dementia. You know why the dementia? Well, why the bone fractures? Well, guess what? If you're not absorbing calcium and magnesium, good luck having strong bones after 10 years on an antacid. B12 deficiency, obviously, you absolutely require good, strong stomach acid along with something called intrinsic factor to liberate B12 from your food. Um, and I've, I've said even in my book, um, my book, I'm pointing to my bookshelf, the book that I wrote, The Alzheimer's Antidote, I noted in there that a B12 deficiency alone can contribute to cognitive impairment. Cognitive impairment and neurological problems are one of the sort of end stage results of a severe long-standing B12 deficiency. You absolutely need vitamin B12 for healthy neurological and brain and cognitive function. And so when you are taking a drug that deliberately inhibits or reduces or interferes with the absorption of these critical minerals and vitamins, what do we expect to have happen? Why wouldn't somebody have increased risk for neurological problems or cognitive problems? Why wouldn't somebody have increased risk for iron deficiency and anemia? Why wouldn't somebody have increased risk for bone fractures, right? I'm to the point that when I look at drugs or when I look at certain pathways, you, you don't have to tell me why a drug would result in X, Y, and Z. When you look at the mechanism by which it works, tell me why it wouldn't result in all these crazy complications that we don't want to have. So, let's see. Yeah, over, so this is what I said before, but I'll read it for clarification. Over the counter antacids may not carry risks quite as severe as prescription versions. Rather than preventing the normal secretion of stomach acid the way, so the prescription drugs are some of the prescription drugs are the ones that actually inhibit those pumps, the PPIs. Um, Over-the-counter antacids typically buffer or neutralize the acid that has been produced. Taken often enough, though, and over the long term, the way so many people use them, it's possible for any of these drugs, whether it's over-the-counter, whether it's prescription, whether it's a proton pump inhibitor, whether it's an H2 receptor agonist, whether it's another of these type of drugs, um, they can all potentially lead to these gnarly consequences just because of the interference with the absorption of those critical nutrients. So, considering these very serious issues, it would be helpful to find a natural strategy for eliminating acid indigestion. Enter carbohydrate restriction, and it only took me 34 and a quarter minutes to get here. Let's look at ketogenic diets for acid reflux, shall we? That's what we all want to know. It's probably what I should have started with. Lesson learned for next time, Amy. 
like I said earlier, right, I kind of wrote this up, it might sound counterintuitive at first that a ketogenic diet could be beneficial for acid reflux. After all, conventional medical advice recommends avoiding fatty foods, so you might think a ketogenic diet would be contraindicated for people with GERD or acid reflux. Plus, some of the foods people frequently enjoy on ketogenic diets are cautioned against in traditional advice for reflux, so, like the things I mentioned before, like coffee, like dark chocolate, like tomato sauces, like garlic, like onions, right? According to this thinking, <laughs> butter in your coffee would be the worst thing you could eat if you had acid reflux, right? But a fatty food and an acidic food, ah, the perfect storm for reflux. Okay. Anecdotes abound on various blogs and forums, but fortunately there's also a solid body of scientific research corroborating what many people have discovered for themselves. However illogical it might seem at first glance, low carbon ketogenic diets have proven very effective for relieving GERD and reflux. You might have already experienced this in your own life. I know, you know, I'm fortunate, privileged to have met many of our favorite low carb ketogenic oriented medical doctors in person. And they tell me people drop an acid medication left and right, usually within days, or maybe they don't always stop the medication so soon, but their symptoms go away. Reflux disappears very often within days of ditching all the carbs. So, <clears throat> and again, I'm actually going to talk about some specific studies that they did and there will be there are links to those in the blog post so if you want to read any of these actual studies and go right to the literature you can huh. if grains and other starchy carbohydrates are among the foods that increase that pressure on that es lower esophageal sphincter it makes sense that eliminate eliminating them from your diet or dramatically reducing consumption of them would have a beneficial effect for acid reflux um, Many people who adopt ketogenic diets for fat loss or for some other goal find that the resolution of acid reflux or GERD is a pleasant, unexpected side effect. Like you might go keto to take care of your migraines or to take care, you know, maybe to help you lose weight or to improve your PCOS. And guess what? Oh my God, serendipity, totally unexpected. Your GERD went away completely too. And you weren't even trying to fix that with keto. That was like a happy accident, right? Um, one study reported on five patients who self-initiated low-carb diets had resolution of GERD. To be fair, three of, now three of the subjects eliminated coffee and all of them el eliminated acidic foods, but the, the authors of the paper said, quote, carbohydrates may be a precipitating factor for GERD symptoms and other, other classic exa exacerbating foods such as coffee and fat may be less pertinent when a low carbohydrate diet is followed, right? I believe that something that can be harmful under one circumstance can be totally neutral under a different circumstance, right? Let's say you're on a standard American or standard Western, uh, Western high carb diet, maybe in that circumstance, eat, let's say it's the carbs causing all that pressure. Well, the fat and the acidic foods and the spicy foods are just gonna make the pain worse because they're just gonna make, it's just more acidic, more irritating to the esophagus. But those foods aren't causing the stuff to come up. So if you go on a diet that's very low in carbs where you don't have the carbs fermenting and bubbling up and creating that pressure, then guess what? Then the fat and the acidic foods and the spicy foods don't come up. They're coming up kind of along for the ride on the gas and bubbles with that that are caused by the carbohydrate get rid of the carbs get rid of the pressure on that sphincter then no matter how acidic your food is or no matter how spicy it is it stays where it's supposed to stay in your stomach below that sphincter which is going to stay closed um let's see another study added weight to the possibility that carbohydrates are a trigger for GERD symptoms in a small cohort of adults with GERD, compared to a liquid meal containing 85 grams of carbohydrate, a liquid meal of the same volume but containing about 180 grams of carbohydrate resulted in greater, greater total time experiencing reflux and a greater number of long reflux periods, periods lasting longer than five minutes. Now, so, so just to repeat, they had... Um, liquid meal same same volume of liquid so whatever i don't i read this so long ago i don't remember if it was eight ounces ago whatever it was the the amount of liquid one of one of them contained 85 grams of carbohydrate one had 180 grams of carbohydrate now to you and me drinking a drink that has 85 grams of carbohydrate 
you're basically doing a friggin' oral glucose tolerance test right there, right? I would never recommend that somebody drink 85 grams of carb, but we're comparing it to something that has over twice as much carbohydrate. Now let's see what happened. Um, a liquid meal, right, the one, the one that had over twice as much carbohydrate, they had greater time experiencing reflux and a greater number of longer periods of reflux. So the liquid meal of 85 grams, the lower carb meal, is not something any good nutritionist would recommend for a low carb or ketogenic diet, but the study wasn't specifically about a low carb diet. It was designed to evaluate, quote unquote from the study, the effect of different carbohydrate density on low esophageal acid and reflux symptoms, and it certainly did. The high carbohydrate meal aggravated GERD more than the low carbohydrate meal. Right, it wasn't, it wasn't talking about the effect of carbs per se, it was looking at different amounts of carbs and that is exactly what it did. This is a way better study that I think this one is a Dr. Westman study, or there's two studies I'm gonna talk about here. They might both be Dr. Westman and colleagues, he's not the only author, but um, a more formal study that did evaluate the effect of a ketogenic diet confirmed the efficacy of carbohydrate restriction for acid reflux and GERD. In a small prospective cohort, obese subjects began a ketogenic diet after undergoing a 24-hour esophageal pH probe test that actually measures the pH of the esophagus. So we don't just have subjective measures of these people saying, yeah, I feel better, yeah, I don't feel any reflux. They actually measured the acidity of the esophagus, objective measurement. Uh, within just, so I guess the job, Within just six days, within six days of starting the ketogenic diet, subjects had dramatic improvements in GERD. The johnson demeester score is used to measure esophageal acid exposure. Now remember, your stomach is supposed to be acidic. Esophagus, not really supposed to be that acidic. A score greater than 14.72 indicates reflux. Greater than 14.72 means reflux. At baseline, subject's mean score was 34.7. So clearly these people definitely had reflux. They had a definite in indication of an acidic esophagus. After just six days, it had dropped to 14.0. So cut more than in half in six days of a ketogenic diet, their esophaguses, esophagi, were half, more, less, less than half as acidic. And they, I mean, they no longer met the the technical definition for GERD because if it's above 14.72 and they were 14.0, guess what? Technically no longer had GERD. The percent of time during which their esophageal pH was very low, meaning high, highly acidic, mean a low pH means acidic. So the percent of time during which esophageal pH was very low was cut in half and they reported significant improvements in their symptoms via a standard GERD questionnaire that assesses subjective feelings of heartburn, pressure or discomfort in the chest, a sour taste in the mouth, frequent gurgling in the stomach, nausea, a feeling of pressure or a burning sensation in the throat, belching, flatulence, and more. If you have all those symptoms and you have reflux and GERD, man, am I sorry for you. How about you just do a ketogenic diet? And here's the thing, just to, to hammer this home again, this study is telling because not only did the subjects report improvements in their own symptoms, but the reduced esophageal acidity was confirmed by direct measurement. They, they actually measured the acidity of the esophagus. So we know this worked. We know their esophaguses, esophagi, became less acidic within six whopping days of stopping eating a lot of carbohydrate. There is, it gets better, it gets better. Um, in the most impressive study performed so far, in a cohort of obese women, after just 10 weeks, now this is 10 weeks, much longer, but after 10 weeks on a low-carb diet, in all subjects with a confirmed GERD diagnosis, quote, all GERD symptoms and medication usage had resolved in all women. That's right, within only 10 weeks, all subjects with GERD had complete resolution of symptoms, including women who'd experienced symptoms twice daily or as often as five times per week. All medication, both prescription and over-the-counter, was discontinued. Ten weeks, what is that, two and a half months? Within two and a half months, women who'd had GERD, assuming for years, again, I haven't read the actual study in a long time, probably dealing with this problem for years, in ten weeks of a low-carb or ketogenic diet, 
Med need for medication, gone. Signs and symptoms, gone. Happy as clams, living life without acid reflux. The authors noted, quote, contrary to long-held belief that higher fat intake promotes GERD symptoms, nationally representative data do not show a strong association between dietary fat and GERD. Thus, the present study provides important insights that contribute to the accumulating evidence of a role for dietary simple carbohydrates in GERD pathophysiology. Again, still quoting from the study, we found that simple carbohydrates, particularly sucrose, which is table sugar, contribute to GERD in obese women, and the likelihood of having GERD was predicted by simple carbohydrate and total sugar intake. Guess what? If sugar is causing GERD, guess what happens when you stop eating sugar? So um, I'm done reading. Let me see if I need to recap anything. I know I've said everything I was going to say uh, or everything that I needed to say, but if you are out there living with acid reflux, if you have GERD and you're not already doing a low-carb or ketogenic diet and you happen to find this video by magic, um, get your hands on a copy of this book because if you are on an antacid drug, uh, whether it's over-the-counter or you pop them like crazy, uh, sorry, whether it's prescription or whether it's an over-the-counter that you're just taking like crazy for a very long time, do yourself a favor, read this book, and um, understand why you don't want to be getting rid of your stomach acid all the time. You just need to manage this issue in a very different way. And let's see. Clearly, there is a role for diet in acid reflux, in GERD, it's just not what we're traditionally told. It's not the spicy food, it's not the acidic food, it's not the whatever, it's not the fatty food. Um, now, I'm not dismissing that possibility though. If you are doing a low carb or ketogenic diet and you've been doing it for several weeks or months and you are still dealing with severe GERD or acid reflux, maybe it is something in your diet that is doing it like clearly it's not the carbs anymore because you're doing keto or very low carb maybe it is the coffee maybe it is the onions the garlic the whatever the the spicy peppers i'm not saying those things are never a cause i'm saying start with cutting the carbs first if that doesn't work then look okay now where am i at with foods because you might if you're not doing a low-carb or ketogenic diet, you might have eliminated some of your favorite foods from your diet and still have the reflux, right? Maybe you thought it was the chocolate, so you cut out chocolate. Maybe you thought it was the coffee. You gave up coffee, God bless you, because I could never do it. Maybe you gave up the spicy hot, you know, the hot sauce you like. Maybe you gave up whatever vinegar, you know, buffalo wing sauce and all that. Maybe you don't have to because maybe none of that is causing your problem. Maybe you would be able to consume as much of that as you want if you just got rid of the carbs. So I guess that's kind of it. Um, all I know is that reflux just tends to go away really quickly and really easily and nicely on a low carb or ketogenic diet. If you're doing a ketogenic diet and you need or want help, or if you're not doing a ketogenic diet, um, but you want to get started and you want to get started simply in a way that's uncomplicated and not crazy and you don't have to read a book that is this thick for 500 pages i just saw a new book come out it said something about uncomplicating the most confusing diet ever or simplifying the most confusing diet first of all Keto's not confusing. It's only as confusing as you choose to make it or as confusing as the people out there you listen to choose to make it. And uncomplicating it, simplifying it, the book is almost 500 pages long. What, what's the complicated version? 800 pages? Are you joking me? If you are doing keto and need help or you want to get started and you don't know where to start, go to my website too at nutrition.com. There's a tab that says work with me. You can find out about my consultations. Um, I'm based in North Carolina, but I work with people all over the U.S. and even internationally. So you don't even have to be in the U.S. We can work together on Skype or something like that. And that's it, I guess. Again, I will see you in Houston the end of October, and I'll be in Brazil in November. Go to my website, toitnutrition.com, and click on Meet Me in Person. You can see where I will be. And if you like these videos, if you find them helpful, if you find them educational, I know they're long, but they're educational, I hope, you can support me by 
using my links on Amazon to get stuff. I, I have an Amazon affiliate, so if you want to get this book, you know, click on my affiliate, or you can support me on Patreon, patreon.com slash two at nutrition. Uh, you can join for as little as $2 a month. Buy me that cup of coffee. I don't have reflux. I can drink. <laughs> um, $2 a month or, you know, higher levels get you more things. $5 a month gets you early access to blog posts. When I put out a blog post, if you are a patron at the $5 or above level, you get to read that blog post a couple days before the rest of the world. And that's it. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.